Welcome to the Recovery Stories Podcast, bringing you stories of hope, healing, and triumph over the bondage of addictions, mental health struggles, trauma, and dysfunctional family systems. Our courageous storytellers have chosen to live their journey out loud in order to show others that they don't have to suffer in silence. The stories you will hear are raw, real, and may involve graphic and triggering content. This podcast is brought to you by Promises Behavioral Health's Rooted Alumni Community. If you or a loved one are struggling, have questions, or are ready to take the next step, call our admission center at 877-351-7504 or visit us online at www.promisesbehavioralhealth.com. Our team is ready and waiting to answer the call for help. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Rooted Recovery Stories. My name is Patrick Custer, and I'm your host. And I am Hi, so glad. I'm so glad that you're here, everyone watching or listening, but also our special guest, Wes Gear. Thank you so much for for coming on our show today. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, for those of you who don't know, um, Wes is the former head uh, guitar player for Head PE and the band Corn. Um, He's also the founder of Rock to Recovery and author of a book that's about to come out called, and let me get this right, Rock to Recovery, Music as a Catalyst to Human Transformation. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So when we get when we get to the end of your story where you start talking about Rock to Recovery and and all that stuff, I want I want you to go into detail and share more about that when it's coming out and and all that jazz. Yeah, if that's okay. Yeah, let um, me know when we're getting to the end or whatever, you know? Yeah, and thanks, absolutely. Thanks for cool. saying all that stuff, yeah. Yeah, well, I'm glad to finally have you on the show, and um, I'm really excited to hear your story because I've actually never gotten to hear it before, and um, so let's kick things off. I've done enough talking uh, wherever sure. you want to pick up with your story at the beginning. Well, okay, so, you know, where does the story start? Um, I think what I've learned more and more in uh, – well, by the way, hi, I'm Wes, and I introduce myself as an alcoholic, although what got me sober or going towards recovery was ha- having getting, gotten hung up on uh, meth and heroin. And so I thought that was my problem and later found out I'm just an alcoholic. And by the way, did you know that alcohol is a drug? <laughs> so if somebody says, well uh, – you know, whatever, alcohol is not my problem. Drugs are my problem. That's like saying cupcakes aren't my problem. Desserts are my problem. Or it's like saying pie isn't my problem. Desserts are my problem. You know what I mean? Because it's really yep. all a drug. You're all yep. escaping reality. So that's what I have to say to that. That's I've a great watched, way to put it. Well, I've just watched so many people die making this fantasy of a you know, separation. I, I like to break down that wall. But anyhow, so what I've learned now, <laughs> oh man, you know, this world of recovery, everybody's got their opinion, but I can only share my experience, strength and hope and share the things that I had to learn that helped me. And so at first I used to say, I'm Wes, I'm an alcoholic addict. And then I realized, oh, I'm just an alcoholic. Why make myself different? Actually, it was an older guy who said, Wes, why do you got to introduce yourself as an alcoholic addict and make yourself different from everybody else? You don't think that she used to do cocaine? You don't think that he took pills? <laughs> you know, and so I was like, that's yeah. true. Why do I got to make myself different? Anyhow, yeah. I've learned a lot about recovery. You know, I, my sobriety date is 12, 10 of 07. So I have 13 and a half ish years and, um, you know, it's a con, you know, the thing that I've learned about recovery is this is a, it's a constant growth. It doesn't stop and I don't want it to stop. Um, in many ways I'm out running pain, but not avoiding it, going through it, but like meaning like, okay, here's something taking me down and let me work on that thing that I'm getting hung up on. And now I'm right. moving beyond it, out running it. It can't get to me anymore. Cause now I know how to beat it. Uh, anyhow. So one thing I learned is trauma is a big part of this thing called addiction. You know, um, I think you, there's a lot of different, you know, information and, um, data and numbers about it. But I, I think arguably you could say that almost all addiction somewhere in there is trauma. Of course, there's mm-hmm. exceptions. How many exceptions, how, what percentages exceptions? I don't know. So then what is trauma? We got to define that. 
you know, I used to think trauma was like if you were in a gunfight or if you were beaten up by a gang member or maybe you were raped, that's trauma. But trauma can be as, as something, an emotional trauma can be something as simple as like a mom saying to her daughter, oh, my God, you have the ugliest toes, Samantha. <laughs> and then the little girl goes, oh, my God, my toes are ugly. Doesn't even realize that that just planted that message. And then you talk to Samantha when you date her and she's 30 years old. And you go, Samantha, how come you never wear open-toed shoes? Yeah. I don't know. Oh, my mom told me my – yeah, that trauma made you be afraid to show your toes to the world. There's all sorts of these subtle emotional traumas and they affect us. you know. And so where does my story start? I don't know. You know, My parents divorced when I was five. My dad was a doctor. My mom was a nurse. They're smart people. Um, and but so but I was in a good family, but I remember them. I just at five, right? We don't remember much, but I remember them getting in a big fight, and it really hurt me on whatever level a five year old could be hurt on watching the parents fight. My dad sure. got me a couple little trinket gifts that night, and I like broke them and threw them in his face. I vaguely remember that. Like, why was I mad at him and not mom? I don't know. And so they divorced, and I used to think, oh, big deal, divorce, that didn't affect me, and then working steps and going through it later. And now even recently, 13 years so, I was meditating, at talking to the universe, going, why do I have these issues with abandonment? Where is this coming from? And it t my meditation took me into like, dude, once your dad was not there – and again, I've done therapies and all sorts of cool stuff and step work – but sometimes I still have these emotional triggers and I asked the universe, like God, whatever you want to call it. And it said, when your dad left, you were getting a one arm hug. Yeah. Your mom loved you, but that was like having one awesome leg. You were missing the other leg and you were missing your dad the whole life. So I was chasing love in women my whole life and all sorts of mm -hmm. stuff, chasing acceptance because something was missing. And so that made me not feel good enough. And then I struggled in school and we moved a lot and I didn't fit in and da da da. So when I finally took that first hit of weed and started drinking, I was like, ah, there it is. I got to do this all the time. Yeah. So How when old do were we? You? So I started smoking weed probably at 14. And, you know, I remember we moved a lot and then I was in Garden Grove and we were there like six years. So I finally felt a little bit planted and I was like, you know, preteen. Uh, and, uh, and then my parents were like, we're going to move to a way better neighborhood. And then I, I was so upset about that. I wrote a letter to like God, which was weird. I found it years later. It really bothered me because I didn't want to move again. And so I was terrified of people in an inward sense. I didn't know it, but it was like, hey, school new here. I'm the new guy. I was just terrified. And so I would hook up with the stoners. It was an easy way to connect. And that was always my way to connect. Oh, you listen to music, you know, whatever, Judas Priest, heavy metal, oingo boingo, whatever. And you want to smoke weed? Let's do that. I didn't want to have to talk. I didn't want to have to have pressure. I just wanted to get high. And that was our way to connect. And that followed all the way in into my later, later years. It was an easy way to connect to people, do partying. Um, so once I started smoking weed, like when do you become an alcoholic? When do you cross that invisible line? Well, AA purists will hate I've had them get mad when I say this, but I smoke weed, smoked weed alcoholically almost from the start. Because once mm. I got into it, I had to have it all the time. I stole money from my dad to get it, and I wanted to be stoned all the time. Mm -hmm. So that to me was alcoholic behavior because the, le the weed was taking charge of my life. I couldn't live my life mm. without it. So I feel like I was an alcoholic uh, at an early age, but then again, it's a progressive disease, but then, but also around 18 or 19, I was quitting things like I should quit weed. I should quit drinking so much on the weekends. Like I kind of felt wrong. I felt like this is probably a bit much. I got kicked out of high school for smoking weed. Now it sounds like a contradiction, but the funny thing is did I ever go, wow, I should quit smoking weed. This is getting me into trouble. No. So Although there was times where I was trying to make changes, also when I would get in trouble, I never really looked at like, hey, this drug and you know booze is the problem. You know, I got DUIs, sure. whatever. Um, I was in a band, shitty. I was a guitar player, dream the rock star dream, and uh, had a bunch of crappy bands. And um, 
then I uh, want, you know, I was kind of a weekend was that, warrior. Was that something that you had, can, uh, was yeah. that something that you had wanted to do like a, a dream and aspiration since, yeah. since childhood that you loved music or was it something you fell into because of the lifestyle with marijuana and partying? And Well, I love music. It was in me, but I didn't really latch on. You know, when you're younger, you don't have music that's personal to you. It's just kind of the adults music, yeah. the classical music, the everything I think, but I liked it. But then when I found rock music and back, Back then, you know, heavy metal and Rush and Dead Kennedys and all these things, I really got into it. And then when I heard Iron Maiden and Eddie Van Halen, I was like, I got to make these sounds of these screaming guitars. And and I got obsessed with it, uh, coupled with I was a new kid in a new town. So the guitar became my best friend and I would smoke weed and just four hours of guitar. And that was my happy place. Um, so, yeah, it was like I was I remember my young friends going, Wes, you don't think you can make it. That's what they called it back then. Make it, do you? And I would turn on the radio and say, I think I can do this. Listen, I can do that, can't I? And so I I just – people off on, a, off on a tangent, people ask like, how did you do it or whatever. It's kind of like I imagine people like Kobe Bryant or whatever, you know, Michael Jordan. I feel like what made Kobe Bryant go shoot a 1,000 free throws? I don't really think he had a choice. I think it's like, I want to do that. I, I'm not stopping. I'm not stopping. And that's how I was. I'm not stopping. I'm not stopping. I yeah. want to go. I want to go. And I had, I also have perfectionism in my story of not feeling good enough. So I overcompensating with having to be special and having to be extra and having to be great on guitar. Yeah. So that was part of it too. Um, anyhow, so, you know, I was, I was kind of a heavy drinking weekend warrior. I'd quit smoking cigarettes and I kind of just had it down to, uh, beer and tequila and then i came home drunk and was going to go to rehearsal one day and somebody my my roommates were like they came up sniffing something i was like hey what is that and then they they said it's heroin i was like i'll try heroin okay and then i did it and uh my friend said i'll drive with you to rehearsal i said good because i'm drunk next thing you know i was like going really fast right. and i wrote i wrote two songs on the way to rehearsal and i was like i thought heroin was supposed to make you you know melodies and this idiot that was speed so i got really into speed and while i was really into speed i started artistically having really writing great stuff find, using it as a muse and uh was starting to get our band was getting really popular and i was like the creative director if you will so, you know, why do I share that? Not to glorify it, because on one hand, it was killing me. And the other hand, it was my muse. But, you know, there's writers out there who, like, I need my whiskey to write, or moms that need their wine, or students that need their Adderall. On some level with addiction, it's working for us. That's why we do it. Right. You know what yeah. I mean? We're, it's working for us. And so that gets us in. But while it's working, it's all, what, it's, what it says, alcohol gave me wings, and then it took away the sky. There's that silly saying. That's kind of, you know, it's true. So on one hand, you couldn't tell me I had a problem because I was finally getting a record deal. And on the other hand, I was 123 pounds and six foot tall. So hmm. um, I went and um, toured like that for a number of years, trying, you know, what does it say in the big book, trying every imaginable way to prove to everybody I could control and enjoy my drinking, drink like a gentleman and all this stuff. You know, it's the cocaine. Don't drink whiskey. All right. Jonathan Davis from Corn lectures me because he heard about my drinking. He's like, dude, you got to get off the Jack Daniels. That stuff's crazy. And then so I started drinking vodka. That's going to cure it. You know what I mean? Yep. Fast forward, my brother, you know, okay, so I leave my first band, Head PE, and I start working with my brother. And then I fell back into drugs because I fell into a depression, losing my identity with the band. I didn't realize how much that was going to affect me. So I went back to all the drugs I had kind of weaned off of, and it got really bad and dark. Um, I was now I was doing meth and heroin mm. and uh, looking like a like a zombie. It was bad. Wearing makeup, going – because <laughs> – so I would wake up in the morning after zero sleep, have to go to the office and look like a vampire, and I saw some girl left some makeup there, and I was like – well, it well, looks seems like my bags are going away, and I think people <laughs> probably saw me. And they'd go, they were doing the like, Wes, how are you? And I would I would pretend it was like, how are you? And I'd be like, I'm great, man. How are you? And they're probably going, dude, you know, uh, this yeah. is not good. Yeah. So finally, you know, I broke down with my brother and I told him what had been going on, why I'm a whack job with erratic behavior and looking like I'm death warmed over, and uh, 
you know, again, he was a guy who could smoke a little weed and drink a margarita. And he's like, just quit the drugs, you know, and it'll be okay. Again, somebody's suggesting to me, but not knowing about alcoholism. Yeah. And I, I couldn't. I would like, I got this thing, like I'm going to the gym at 5 a.m. every day, yay. But then a week would go by and I'd say, well, I can have a Corona, go to the bar, have a Corona, go, oh, I'll have a shot of Jaeger. And then I'd wake, be at the at the Coke dealer's house three days later going, I don't even like cocaine. How'd this happen? Mm -hmm. So I failed all these, you know, my brother was trying to help me, you know, get my life in order. I failed every test I gave myself. And so the deal was he was going to tell the family he did had a little intervention and I agreed to go to rehab. Actually, when the intervention happened, he was like, you're fired. You're out of here. You're on your own. Best thing you ever did. Do whatever you want if you want, but if you want to get your job back, you got to get help. And then maybe you'll get your job back. And even then I was like, Maybe I'll go take my last thousand dollars and ride elephants in Thailand. Maybe that's what I'll do. <laughs> and then was this, this was this when you were playing for corn? No, I didn't get the corn gig yet. This that's, there's a cool okay. story about that. Uh so 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 then that they have this thing in recovery where they call it your moment of clarity. Then it hit me, and my moment of clarity was when I just I heard this voice say, Wes, you're out of control. And I know that sounds so obvious, but it was the first time it really hit me that mm -hmm. I'm not in control. I'll never be in control. I haven't been in control because I kept trying to go, okay, I'm just going to go drink a couple beers and then, oh, it's been two weeks. Like I just, it was insane. And when that hit me on the deepest level, I just started bawling. And I was like, no, I'm going to go to a treatment center. And then when I went in the treatment center, I just wanted one that was 30 days. Uh, and I went to newfound life in Long Beach because I said, yeah, 30 days, you can do 30 days. Just keep an open mind. By about 20 something days, I was like, I'm not ready to get out of here. And it wasn't that I thought I was going to use. I just knew I was just barely thawing out, you know? Yep. But when I got in there as a 12 step place and I got into the big book and I, and it answered a lot of questions for me, like, um, it said our alcoholic life seems the only normal one. You know, meaning like I, because to me, I thought everybody was on meth. I thought everybody did heroin. I thought everybody drank like I did. Mm. And it's not true, mm. you know, but my mm. brain made up this fantasy world. Yep. It said in the big book, we're restless, irritable, and discontent unless we take a drink, you know, and then the ease and comfort comes. And I was like, yeah, that explains why when I'm trying not to drink or use, I just felt so bored. And I'm like, well, I did my laundry. I, clean the house. What else is there to do? I got to go use. It's like I'm restless, irritable, discontent. So I have to pick up again. The powerlessness. And then the, the allergy was really the key. It talked about the allergy. And I was, because if you asked me when I went to rehab, is beer your problem? I would have said, hell no. I don't even care about beer. But what I learned is the allergy is like when I drank that Corona, it wasn't enough. And then I said, well, let me do a shot of Jaeger. I don't even like Jaeger. So I can do a shot. And then it sets off the allergy. I'm like, I'm not high enough. Okay, now I'm going to go to the dealers. Yep. So, you know, there might be people listening to this podcast or whatever who, you know, they're like, well, I didn't drink that or do that drug or whatever. It doesn't matter. It's about the behaviors. It's yeah. about when you pick up that first drink of wine, does it set you off on a run that you can't stop? Did you have a problem staying stopped? Because lots of us can stop. And by the way, the big book doesn't tell us how to stop drinking. It's saying basically if you're at a point where you've found that grace to stop for a few days and kind of – it talks about like don't really even try to do this work with a, somebody who's really fresh. Let them thaw out for a couple of days so they can hear what we're trying to tell them. It yeah. says in the big book if you're not sure you're an alcoholic, go to the nearest bar and drink and try to start and stop, not just once but a couple times. It might be worth the case of the jitters to find out you're really an alcoholic. So by the time we get in the big book of the 12 steps, it's assuming you've stopped for a minute by yourself and yeah. kind of got enough you know, consciousness back to hear what's in the book enough to do the step work and whatever and get that transformation. And that's what I got, you know, um, I got what it said would happen, you know, by, it says in the 10th step that, uh, 
by the time we get to the 10th step, the problem has removed, been removed from us. That's the great fact for us. We're neither cocky nor are we afraid. You know, it's been, it's been just removed and that's what I experienced. So did you, uh, how long, how, how long did you end up staying in treatment? I know you said you, you had planned on 30 days, but I just did two, I did two months, but it felt good. But then the other thing too, is that like, um, you know, there's a lot of people will say, you know, God did all this for me. And da -da. I'm like, eh, no. Yeah. I believe that like, there's this, there's this magic spiritual quotient, but I had to say, okay, to stuff. I had mm -hmm. to call my sponsor. I had to listen and do what they said. And me. And so I wonder why I hear her, hear stuff that other people don't hear, but I heard go to a meeting every day. I heard when you go out of treatment, you should go to sober living and stay kind of like really tight knit. You should move back home right away. You've made all these newly sober friends stay in that area. So I stayed in Long Beach. I listened to what they told me to do. So I did treatment for two months, but then I stayed in sober living for a couple of months. And then the next place I got was with another sober guy, you know, which thank God. Because when I finally, after about six months out of treatment, got our my first apartment with somebody that was a normal apartment, I was pulling she, uh, my pillows out of storage, and then I found a chunk of heroin in the pillowcase, one that I had lost. Like, oh, that's where that thing was. And if I didn't have another sober guy with me, yeah. it was me by myself, even though I had worked some steps. Because I remember I was like, Jimmy, Jimmy, I found heroin. And I really let it up to Jimmy. And Jimmy said, throw it down the toilet right now. If Jimmy was like, yeah, let's do it. I wouldn't have had the, the mm -hmm. ability to say no at that time. And yeah. that, that was God doing for me what I couldn't do for myself. By the way, Jimmy did AA for a while. And we are roommates. And then he's like, you know, I'm not into AA and the God thing anymore. And he relapsed. And he's dead now. Wow. So. God bless you, Jimmy. Thanks for saving my life. And then we lost him. And he was an amazing kid from an amazing family. And uh, But there's those little moments, man, that I think a lot of us have when we're trying to stay sober that we, if we don't have the people around us or the sponsor to call yeah. or we're not really entrenched in a recovery program or a recovery community at least. Maybe yep. AA isn't your thing. Maybe it's smart recovery. Maybe whatever. But there's going to be that time they call it what some people call is your picket fence, right? The, yeah. the, the fence of the five people with five years or more, whatever, those people who know you. Um, and for me, I know that if I had gone to rehab in Long Beach and went right back to Huntington to my old friend, I, would, I wouldn't have made it. I needed a very mm -hmm. segmented process. Yeah, makes sense. So what was yeah. it? What did that look like? Uh, you know, you, you go live in a halfway house and um, – uh, you know, and I, I know the typical trajectory that we, we tend to see with the, uh, you know, we, people go to a halfway house, do a simple job, whatever, but were you doing music that whole time? Uh, did you, did you jump right back into it? Um, what, what no. kind of transpired? Well, this is a fun thing to talk about because I, I really, from my own perspective and working with others feel like humans rely way too much on our, on our brain. Our brain's going to try to calculate based on old data and it mm. forgets the miracles or the th crazy stuff that can happen that we never could have imagined that just goes mm. right for us. And especially when you're coming into recovery, you know, our brain, my brain, well, I'll use myself as an example, said like, you can never do music again. Like that's not part of a sober life. And I gave it up and I wasn't doing it for a while. Um, which maybe it was good. Maybe it was good. But then I had, you know, two years or so and I met her and got engaged and then I stopped working my program. She became my higher mm -hmm. power. Um, meaning like, you know, I just built my life around her, stopped doing AA and eventually the insanity came back and said, ah, you could drink a beer. Beer wasn't your problem. And then luckily I went out and stumbled six months and I made it back. Once I went back to meth and heroin, I called my sponsor and got back in the rooms. Um, but it was about two years sober the second time when I would go out to see, and I had like, kind of, uh, kind of like when you grieve the loss of your dog or a loved one, I had let go of music. And, and again, 
it's hard to create when you're a lot of people artists will talk about it, when you're newly sober or you're used to party you have this whole weird feels weird sober life how do you even do music and art again um mm-hmm. but i would go to shoot shows and it would be painful not in the egoic sense my ego was crushed when i left head pe and people would go dude i heard you left your band i was like i didn't realize how much it was gonna hurt like oh like who am i now i'm nobody yeah that was the ego this was my soul going, I'm supposed to be on stage playing. I don't even care about money or fame. I'm just supposed to play and make music again. So I was, I, I was still working with my brother. And um, you know, the thing is the 12 steps are designed for living from spiritual practices, from Buddhism and Christianity, all these great things that help us get a transformation and how to stay aligned and connected to higher power, the spirit of the universe, divine intelligence, or stay out of lower self, whatever you want to talk about. So I've, I've been using this as a design for living daily. So when I was at my brother's, I had barely graduated high school. So I'm like, how do I get out of this job? I hate it. And so all I had left was prayer and meditation. Like, okay, I'll try this prayer and meditation. Stuff. Meanwhile, I found all these people in the rooms going, oh my God, I lost my job. What am I going to do? I don't know what I'm going to do. And then two weeks later, they go, oh my God, I got a better job. I mean, it's bad. I get more money. It's close to my home. I can't even believe it. And I was like, fuck you. I was so jealous of these people. I was so mad. <laughs> so I was like, how do I get out of this job? My brother, he's paying me good. I hate the work. It was like indoor. It was a great job, but I just knew I didn't belong there. And how do I get out? So I just got really yeah. into prayer and meditation. And I was doing these ah meditation, ah. Ah, uh, you visualize what you want. You bring questions in. You ask for what you want, and you ah, uh, you meditate on it. Like the energy coming out of your root chakra, out your third eye. It's a Wayne Dyer meditation. I did it out of desperation, not because I'm like, yay, hippie stuff works. I was just desperate, and I asked for my music career back. And while I was doing this, then when I looked at the clock, every time I looked at the clock, it was one 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 two 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 three three three. I never heard of this stuff. All I started, it was weird. Then I was like, my brother's going to fire me. Me and my brother didn't battle. I started going, it was like, I feel like he's going to fire me. Then I had this obsessive thought. I feel like some rich guy wants me to travel with him. I mean, I've traveled the world with the music, with the band. I would be, you know, good, uh, you know, um, chaperone or whatever, sober companion, I guess it would be kind of. I kept obsessing on that thought. And then I was also like, I need a check for $10,000 to start a business. These are the weird thoughts I had that kept going in my head. Well, I don't know where my brother fired me. Within two weeks, my friend goes, I'm in Hong Kong. I need you to fly out here and help me stay sober. And then I got a check out of nowhere for head PE for $10,000. I was like, bam, bam, bam. This is the shit I was meditating on. Like, what? Wow. Wow. And so when my friend called me two weeks after me getting fired, because of course I was terrified when I got fired, I was like, wait, 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 I feel like I'm aligned. And then I said, why do I keep seeing two, 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 three, two, three, four, four, four? And some one of my hippie friends was like, that means you're spiritually aligned. I'm like, okay. And then I meditated and I said, I want my career back in music and I'm not getting in the van. I'm too old for that. It better be a great band. It better be a great band. And then within 10 days of that, Corn hit me up and texted me and was like, do you want to come play guitar with us? Now, here's the thing. Remember that thing I was talking about, the lies that our head tells us? Yeah. Like, we're going to get sober and our brain's like, sobriety's going to be lame, dude. Well, first <laughs> of all, you're vomiting blood or you're a junkie right. or you've lost your car. Nobody wants to talk to you. Your, your life's in the shitter and sobriety's going to be lame. Have you ever experienced mm-hmm. sobriety? No, but it's going to be lame. I know it. It's like. So our brain makes up these lies. That's what they are. They're lies. They're based not in fact. They're based in fear. Well, my brain said I could never do music again because I'm sober. Well, Korn reached out to me because they wanted a sober guitar player. The guy they had at the time, his name is Shane Gibson. He was a music virtuoso, like insane. Well, he drank himself to death. I think he was in his 30s. Mm. And he was doing that while I was getting into the band. So I got the corn gig because I was sober. So that's an important message to tell people because I think a lot of times we think we're giving up parts of our life or who we are because I was a drinker. I was a cigarette smoking, weed smoking drinker. That's who I am. It's like, no, that's not who you are. Let go of who you aren't and you will become more of who you are. 
if you're a teacher, if you're a mom, if you're a guitar player, if you're a gym nut, whatever, let go of that stuff and you will truly become more of what you are. And that's the goal of uh, the 12 steps. If we keep living it in our life, we continue to let go of stuff that is in us, you know, deeper and deeper into this process. That's so true. Yeah. Yeah. So you're deep into the process. They ask you to go. What happens next? Uh, Corn, you mean? Yeah. Well, that's actually a cool story too. Um, because the, Jonathan was kind of the singer was the kind of the, the captain of the ship mm-hmm. and monkey, the guitar player wanted me in, but they hadn't, weren't talking about it. I don't know why, but they needed to have this conversation, like to make the change. Jonathan was kind of happy with this guy, Shane, cause Shane was a monster guitar player, but monkey was, was not so happy with him. So tour after tour, you know, you go on tour for a month or two months. So they kept leaving a tour coming back. And I was like, am I going to get this gig or not? So, you know, the old stoner me would have been like, whatever, man, I don't know why they're not getting back to me. But the new recovery me was like, no, you go after it. So I got a CD of theirs and I put it in Pro Tools and I ripped out the other guitar parts and I recorded myself playing basically their whole live set and sent it out to them. But of course, what do bands never do? They never listen to a CD somebody sends mm-hmm. them. So if you're at home and you're in a band and you give it to a band, they ain't gonna listen to it, trust me. There's In the tour bus, there's a stack of 30 CDs that nobody will listen to. You walk in and you're like, yeah, give them their CD. Actually, nobody gives CDs anymore anyhow. We'll probably give them yeah. MP3s. But anyhow. So then I was like, well, I thought of some of my idols, my heroes who are kicking butt in life and I, and I, I kind of had analyzed some of my heroes and I, I looked that they were, they had talent and then they had a lucky break. And when they had that lucky break that they blew it up is what I call it. Like they went in all in and just like, so I had the talent of the music. I got the lucky break that Corn asked me. So now I had to blow it up, like go in in the biggest way. So I took the last yeah. of my money and I flew out to see them on tour and I went to like small cities so they wouldn't be bugged in like a New York or LA where there's too many, you know, cool people. And uh, I had to talk to Monkey. I had to talk to Jonathan. I was trying to get him to handle it. They were kind of blowing me off. They're busy. They're on tour. And then I, I, I went, hey, man, I got to talk to Jonathan. Oh, man, Jonathan, he's in the tour bus. Jonathan's busy right now. He can't talk to you. And I was like, oh, man, all right. Well, I guess this didn't work out. And then I remembered hearing this quote. Your success will be determined by how many uncomfortable conversations you're going to have. And I spent the last of my money to fly out to North Carolina to fall around for a couple of days. I couldn't get the meeting. I couldn't get it going. And right then I turned around and I said, no, man, go get Jonathan. I flew out here. I want to talk to Jonathan. Tom West is here. And that was like, oh, okay, cool. And then Jonathan came out. He goes, what's up? I go, do you hear my CD? No, I didn't hear it. Well, dude. He goes, oh, I didn't know that. I go, I'm ready to go, man. And we had this great conversation. He goes, oh, cool. And then he knew nothing about it, Monkey and Tacos. Then I see him go play the show. And so we're outdoor at an outdoor you know, arena. And they're behind the big curtain. And I see him talking, Jonathan and Monkey. I'm like, I wonder if they're talking about me. Nah, they're probably like, hey, bro, ready to rock. And after the show, Monkey came up and he goes, ah, Jonathan told me you talked to him. It's great. It's on. You're, you're going to start with us at the George Lopez show. So it's like, that's all recovery, man. It's all recovery. I would have never done that. Even if I was controlling you to join my drinking, none of that would happen. And I got one other quick little anecdote too. Do you have time for another one? Yeah, absolutely. All right, check this out. So before that day happened, I'm falling corn around trying to get tight with them so they know I'm not the drunk wet because they knew me from before. They knew like this guy's a maniac. So I knew I had to be around and let them see that I'm cool because half the reason you pick people to go in a band, they got to be cool. It's not just about the playing. You don't want to tour yeah. the world in a tour bus on the planes with some guy who's annoying as hell. So <laughs> I had to show them that I'm cool. I can hang. So I went – so I had – set up this time to make amends to my father who I'd stole money from when I was younger. And, you know, and what I was taught is the AA always comes first or your recovery program always comes first. If my recovery doesn't come first, then I can't show up 
if I'm a father, I can't show up for my kids. If I'm a husband, I can't show yeah. up for my wife. I can't show up and be a good employee if my recovery isn't spot on. Yeah. So, so that again, those are the me- one of the messages I heard. Why some people can't hear that, I don't know. I was blessed enough to hear that stuff. So I have this plan to take. I'm run- remember I'm running out of money to go see my father where he lived in Alturas, which is basically you have to fly to Reno, and I had to drive three hours north into the middle of nowhere there's not even a starbucks there or a mcdonald's <laughs> to his ranch to make just to give you perspective uh yeah how small this town is to make an amends and sit in his little house with him well corn was playing around the area and so i was like oh my god i gotta go get this corn gig nothing and this is important i want people to hear it like nothing's more important than getting the corn gig dad can wait right dad's gonna be there the corn gig comes once in a lifetime and i was like no man you told your dad you were going to be there this weekend. Recovery comes first. You've been a flaky, drunken druggie your whole life. You show up for your father. I was like, all right, man, I'm going to trust this process and go there. Well, guess what? When I was getting off the plane in the Reno airport, I saw a poster of somebody playing there the next night. Guess who? Corn. Yeah. So wow. by putting – my program first, God, the universe, I'm getting chills now, put me right yeah. there. So what was great is they were playing Reno. Nobody hangs out in Reno. Nobody's bugging corn. So Monkey gave me his suite. We got to hang out, bro down. So going and put my program first and letting the universe take care of the rest actually put me in the best position mm. uh, to get the corn gig. And that's those are the messages you hear in a variety of ways when you – listen to people who really put the stuff into their life, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And stick with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, with you, you tour with corn, stay with the band in recovery. Um, and ha- had, did you stay sober ever since then? Been sober ever since. So 12, 10, 07, I got the corn gig in like Oh nine or something like that. And then I've been sober since like 13 and a half years. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That is awesome. So yeah. um, what led from doing corn and being on, you know, touring with them and everything into your path of working with, um, you know, start fa- founding the uh, rock to recovery. There's a, there's a line in the big book, something like, It was circumstance rather than virtue that led us to do these things we do. Basically saying like our life was so screwed up that we had to do this. It wasn't because we're saints and wanted some spiritual transformation. So so like as much as I want to say like, oh, I'm just a giving soul that wanted to start Rock Recovery. What it was is the corn gig was going away. Brian Welch, a.k.a. Head, was coming back to the band. Writing was on the wall. And I don't know what age I was, 40, give or take. And uh, I was like, oh, my God, I'm out of career. I never went to college. That's why I was working with my brother because I really didn't have any skills per se. What am I going to do now? Well, like Mm -hmm. I said, I don't know what to do in desperate times other than live this program. So I went back to my prayer and meditation. And I wanted to get into self-pity because I was like, well, man, you know, some there's a part of us inside where like, God, I got to be sober. Poor me. You know, you you don't want to have to be an alky if we didn't have to be or a sober person. And then I was like, yeah. man, and I, I feel like I was called to be a musician. So I was sentenced to be a broke musician, sober musician. This sucks. So instead of getting into self-pity, what we do is we use the tools. And I went into prayer and meditation. I was like, all right, God, I don't think you are sent me here to suffer and have a crappy life. So if I'm supposed to be sober, which clearly I am, and I'm supposed to be a musician, and here was the key. I said, how do I help people and make a living? And that was taught to me from recovery because it teaches yeah. us that we that putting others before ourselves is the key. And I feel like that was the difference in the prayer. It wasn't just like, give me a job. I got to make 100K a year. I was like, how do I take who I am and help people and make a living? Mm-hmm. And and then this idea for Rock Recovery came to me. And I, at first it was just to – I just wanted to make <clears throat> enough money to pay my bills because, again, I was broke. Yeah. And it really started taking off, man. I pitched it for six months. People would go, that's a great idea. You want to hire me? 
no, well, it's, it's not the right for us. Oh. And so at the after six months, finally, I pitched it from like October all the way to May. I founded the organization on 12, 12 of 12. Whoa. Yeah. So I started pitching in October before that. I found the organization 12 of 12, and I finally got a gig in May of 13. And uh, even in the first sessions, it was like this thing using magic to like have what Rock Recovery does because nobody knows is we write songs with non-musicians. So we walk into the room. It could be veterans, whatever. And we'll take whatever, six, eight, 10, 12 people, check in, connect on a place of, you know, emotional, where are we at today? What do we want to talk about? Songs are basically feelings and thoughts put to music. We write the lyrics together and we write the song and record it in one hour, hour and a half, whatever the length of time we're given is. And, uh, I, you know, I watched people come in dope sick, physically ill for like, it's like the worst flu and they would be transformed. Like going from what is this stupid music program? Why am I doing this? And by the end, they're like, Oh my God, are you coming next week? Like, I was like, wait, wait, you, I know what it's like to be dope sick. You are physically dope sick. And now you don't, I don't even feel dope sick anymore. What? I saw mm-hmm. girls come in. My friend just don't need my best friend. I know. You probably don't want to do this right now, but let's try because this is how music works. And by the end, they'd be giggling. The spirit's, spirit's lifted. lifted. Yeah. There's not a drug in the world that can do that. If you're depressed and you drink, you're going to be more depressed. If you're like bummed out or whatever and you are take acid, you're going to be bummed out and tripping. Like this, but music gets inside our brain on the left side and the right side and just takes over our body and changes our whole mm-hmm. vibration. It helps with serotonin, dopamine, oxytocin. It does a whole thing to your brain and body chemistry. And so when therapists would walk by the room and see like we'd get, cause we know how we have a science to what we do. You know, when we tell people, Hey, you want to sing? I ain't singing. By the end we get them singing. And yep. the therapist <laughs> goes by and goes, Bob doesn't talk to anybody. Bob's up there, oh, Bob, you know, singing his heart out. <laughs> yeah, but then we're yeah. singing a song that's real to us about where we are in our life, yeah. some sort of positive mantra, you know, being funny, mm-hmm. being serious, being dark, whatever we need to be for that day. And we've been lucky now. We're what? Uh, we're in our ninth year, and we got about fifteen people that do it full time, and we do five hundred sessions a month. Wow! Yeah. Wow! Yeah. That's amazing. And I, you know, I'll say, um, my, I, I've gotten a uh, healthy exposure to it as well. And, um, to compare contrast, you know, you were talking about how, um, the, the program, you know, you, you use it, you've used it with a very various, various types of people. I've, um, uh, witnessed Phil do this program with, um, uh, my alumni at the ranch and, you know, it, alumni and clients uh so Mm -hmm. current clients together and you know you have half of them are sitting there like you know like you were saying i'm not doing craft you know i'll watch Uh, i'm -hmm. I'm just here to observe you know Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh you know and then some eager people but that you know a lot of the clients that are just not ready they haven't bought in yet you know to the the recovery process and they're just not so sure about yeah everybody's you know too self-aware um and uh and exactly what you said happens like from the beginning to the end and everybody is um, participating and connected there. You're, mm-hmm. you, you're watching everybody connect on a level that these people, none of them, none of them in the group have connected with uh, before on that level. And it's, it's like, it's so cool. The, the contrast there is I've also watched this. Y'all do this at a conference where a bunch of people with big egos, um, you know, professionals, with big egos uh, are kind of sitting there the same way going, we'll let the the outgoing charismatic yeah. people that are in the crowd, you know, do this and participate. And, and, you know, everybody that's too important is kind of sitting there just yeah. sitting back. And by the end, that's not the case. And it's really mm-hmm. cool to see that no matter, you know, no matter what this, it, it really transcends, um, everything it, it doesn't matter who you are what your personality type socioeconomic status mm-hmm. um it's a beautiful thing so yeah thank I you lovely rock recovery it's, thank it's you. really cool thank you thank you yeah you know i found that 
the people who will not, even by the end of the set, because usually there's there's almost always somebody who's like, nah, I'm cool, and then they finally mm. open up. The ones who never open up are usually the ones who are just like they're about to AWOL. Like it's it's bad for them. Like they're about to leave recovery. They're not gonna yeah. stay sober. It's it's usually that that it's almost like we could use rock recovery as a defining moment for some some people the first week maybe they're shy and the next week they're more open but the ones who are really 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 against it are usually really 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 against recovery but you know i have this kind of you know theory and obviously i started doing this and i was i knew nothing about what i was doing i just had an idea and now after doing it for hundreds of times over nine years you get you just learn a lot more about it. And, you know, when we come on this planet, we're pure of spirit. We're just little babies. We giggle and dance down the cereal aisle at the grocery store, and we don't care. And then we learn that people make fun of us, and they hurt us, and that mommy isn't always mm -hmm. there. And then we get – the spirit gets crusted over with a hard layer, and we get afraid, and we're inside of that. And so a lot of healing has to happen in the body. And and. You know, in rock recovery, we challenge people. We make them scared. They're under pressure. They're learning to express. There's so many levels that it's therapeutic clinically. But one of the things I noticed is like when I was working with veterans especially, we're talking people who have been blown up across, you know, yeah. body parts and they're still alive. And um, it helped them get down to that childlike, playful spirit again. You know what I mean? And it reminds us that it's still there because yeah. where does that spirit go? It's not gone. It's just deep yeah. under that crusty, hurt, afraid layer. So the people who are like, nah, -uh, no, they're just scared. That's all it is. Yeah. It's you're scared. You're scared. You're going to be judged. You're going to not sound whatever. But so getting to get people to go beyond that fear and express is really what recovery is all about. It's not about mm -hmm. being good. And so there's, we're not the be all end all. There's like, you know, obviously recovery comes, you know, uh, therapeutic modalities come in so many shapes and sizes, but it's really good that we get to use music as the catalyst. Oh, leading up to the book we're going to talk about um, yeah. for human transformation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Perfect segue. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> why not? Yeah. Uh, so tell us about it. Okay, so when I first started Rock Recovery, I went into treatment centers. And a lot of treatment centers are just houses. And so the group room is the garage. So I'm in a garage and then I go in with 10 clients and I'm in there by myself. And, you know, I'm not like doing anything. And by the end, they're like, yeah, wake up and do it. Maybe we're doing a rap song that day. And everybody's like, yeah, I don't do dope no more. You know, and they're singing and they're in their body. And I would walk out and be, I mean, I'm going into like a drug detox at 9 a.m. They're coming in, Seroquil, whatever. And by the end, I got them all like, oh, uh, oh. Uh. And I'm like, is anybody seeing this? Like these transformations? Yeah. So it was always like my thing, like how do we document this, what we're doing? Mm -hmm. So I did it for a number of years and then uh, hired Sonny Mayo, a longtime friend. He's one of my, he's my first hire. He started working at Cliffside which is a super high end treatment center up in Malibu. And a gal walked in uh, uh, who was working there and some, and Sonny talks to everybody. He's the most personable guy. Um, so he said, Hey, to this, Oh, I'm Sonny. And they met and you want to sit in a session. And she's like a PhD clinician. She's like, you guys are going to write a song. This is going to suck. She also, her name is Constance Scharf also worked at a record label for a while doing radio promos. So she had a musical ear. She's like, this is going to be horrible. Well, she saw and was like, wow, this is a song written in an hour. This is actually good and wildly therapeutic. So we made friends and told her this thing. And she said, you got to write a book. I can't write a book. She said, oh, I just happen to be an award-winning author and best-selling author. And so we endeavored to write a book. So over you know these number of years, we mm. chronicled the stories of 18 people you know, black, white, old, young, every demographic, sex trafficking, yeah. you know, uh, trauma, wounded warrior trauma, you know, addiction, mental health, you name it. But in each of these stories, our program was a key catalyst into them in them finding transformation. So it's really a book of hope. And we go into a little bit of the science and how we work and what it does, but it's really 18 stories of like how people found 
a life-saving transformation and we were part part of it and so yeah it's rock to recovery uh music as a catalyst for human transformation and so just to put a finer point on it, the goal for me when i created rock to recovery was remembering my time in rehab and we're painting pictures and we're doing yoga and the guys are farting but how come there's no music? Why are we using music? We all know music is magical. Yeah. So our goal is to help yes. proliferate the use of music as a healing force. Oh, and that you're doing indeed for sure. Um, I love it. That's that's so awesome. So when does the um, when does the book drop? Is it out? July fifth. July fifteen. It will drop on July oh. fifteen. When does this podcast come out? Next week. So great. Yeah. So if you're listening. Uh, you know, some of the proceeds go, uh, full disclosure, we've pumped a lot of money into making the book personally, Constance and I, as, as the writers and, and stuff, but, uh, we are taking a portion of the proceeds to help fund the program rock to recovery. And also, um, you know, our, our selling the book helps us get our message out there of the work we do. And, you know, um, the publisher and the people who've read it said, it's, it's really a book of hope. So if you love inspirational stories, if you're out there, uh, just look for Rock T.O. Recovery. Um, it'll be on Amazon July 15. We'd love your support. Awesome. That'll be right yeah. after this airs. So um, <laughs> perfect. Great timing. Um, well, okay. So we're almost out of time. I want to ask you just a couple final questions. Um, what was the biggest surprise uh, that uh, – the biggest surprise you had in, in sobriety that um, you just, you didn't even know was possible for you uh, before you got sober would have never even imagined for yourself. You, you know, some people say like life beyond my wildest dreams. I don't have a life beyond my wildest dreams. So I don't know what you're talking about. Well, for me to have a life where I didn't, I don't drink or use, and I love my life, was like my is mind blowing yeah. in the simplest sense. And I think it's important to say that. But then there's this other thing. I call it. This is my next book. <laughs> my next book. I call it the vortex of radness. What happens is when we start helping people, and what I found is this community in this world of recovery and people that help people and like, look at you. You're here doing this podcast. And your joy starts coming from not the outside, not the car, not the girl, not the shirt, not the how big are my pecs, but this fulfillment that emanates from the inside. Yeah. And a common purpose that we share together in a community, in a world, and the places it's led me, like I'm now in the desert. I finally bought my first home, never thought that was possible. And I had a meditation that said, when you buy this place in the desert, it's going to be so powerful for you by the way of the people you meet. But sure enough, I met all these incredible people out here I never expected. So it's that whole thing. It's being in the vortex of radness because when I was getting loaded, everything kept going wrong. Yeah. And now these unexpected things happen and this happiness and fulfill uh, fulfillment emanates from within. And I'll tell you this. When you do drugs or get high – you get real high in the beginning, it tapers off and you feel crappy, mm -hmm. you know, some hangover come down. Mm -hmm. But when you get into this natural recovery high or whatever you want to call it, it lasts for days. You know what I mean? It takes yeah. you up and there's no, there's no yeah. like hangover. It like so many times in my recovery, when I talk to other people in recovery, we'll do something amazing. And th three days after we're like, dude, that trip. Oh my God, I'm so thankful. Thank you. Thank you. And you just feel it right here. Yeah. It's so hard. I think if you're brand new, it's hard to hear that stuff because you're like, look, I just want to stop, you know, drinking whiskey. I just want the cop, the court cases to go away. I just want all this chaos in my life to go away. But that's going to go away. But this yeah. high that you're going to get on the back end when you become the most fully realized version of yourself is going to be so beyond anything you could ever expect. Yeah. Um, I, I, uh, I think, you know, there's a, you're talking about something that's, that is a kind of a combination of, um, 
you know, we stay sober long enough, all of a sudden we remember what it feels like to uh, have a, a brain that's equalized and um, healthy, if you will. And um, for me, there was kind of two phases. The first, the one where, where I, re- I had this realization where I was like, man, I haven't felt this in so long. I didn't remember that this was possible, what, what I'm feeling right now, this is probably mm-hmm. at least a year into sobriety that, that mm-hmm. this feeling in, in my brain of health and, and, uh, remembering things and, and all of that was even possible. Um, but then what you're talking about is something that just continues on and on year after year after year. Yeah. Um, it, you know, as long as we keep doing, doing the deal. And I love how you, you phrased it, you know, just this never ending saga of, um, self self-actualization and, um, healing that, you know, to never stop finding ways to improve and deepen our roots, um, and, and find ways to heal, um, and, uh, bring more meaning to our lives and the, the lives of those around us. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then in the big book, like I mean, in a prayer meditation, it says we develop this vital sixth sense. Think about that. It's saying that we get this other sense, this other ability, this intuitive thing that is vital for our existence, but that's where all this magic comes from. It sounds like hippy dippy stuff, but when you talk to enough people who are working this thing, you, they, we all have these stories of like, I don't know what's going on, but there's some magic you could tap into. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, it really is. The vortex of All right, last question for you, Wes. Um, yeah. So for that uh, person watching today or listening um, that is, is identifying with your story um, and struggling, uh, what last piece of encouragement would you like to, to leave with them? Well, in my experience, everybody feels like they're so different. You're not. Hmm. There's people that had it worse than you, better than you, richer than you, poorer than you, whatever. And they found recovery. Mm -hmm. And I hear a lot of people think they're not worth it or it won't work for them. It can because it's worked for so many people, millions of people who have recovered through the, through these years, you know? And, uh, so I want people to know that they're, they're worth it and they can do it. They're not too unique. They're not too broken. They're not too traumatized. They're not too much of an algae or too much of a druggie. And they are not their addiction. They are a unique, special person that deserves recovery. Awesome. I couldn't agree more. Very well yeah. put. Yeah. Um, well, thanks again, Wes. And I wanted to uh, ask you, uh, could you uh, tell our uh, viewers and listeners how they can um, learn more if they want to connect with y'all on social media or, or whatever, yeah. uh, on rock to recovery, what you're, yeah. uh, how to find you. We're really straight ahead. It's rock to recovery, R O C K T O spelt out recovery. Uh, we're on all the socials, uh, like that, you know, mainly Instagram, Facebook. Uh, we have a website, we get the book coming out. Obviously I'm easy to find seven letters. It's Wes gear. So it's W E S G E E R. Uh, shameless plug. I have a new band, uh, called human and we're putting out music right now. We just put out our first song, which is another cool part of recovery. Um, let me see here. I see. Can I hold this up? That's us human. It's H U three H U three M three N H U three M three N. We just put out some music so you can find me all over the place. I'm not that hard to find if you want. Perfect. Exciting stuff. Yeah, well, man. thanks again. Thanks Thank again, you. Wes. This is great. And uh, thanks to everybody for uh, sticking with us and joining us today. I uh, hope you've all gotten some some good stuff out of this. I know I have. Something. So. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. With that, you all have a great day and take care of yourselves. For more information on today's episode, check out the show notes. 
Recovery Stories is brought to you by Promises Behavioral Health's Rooted Alumni Community. If you or a loved one are struggling, have questions, or ready to take the next step, call our admission center at 877-351-7504 or visit us online at www.promisesbehavioralhealth.com. Our team is ready and waiting to answer the call for help. Whether you're watching on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, or listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, please share with your friends. Follow, subscribe, and leave us a review. We are grateful for you and hope that you have been encouraged by today's episode. As always, remember you are only one decision away from a completely different life, and it is never too late to start loving yourself.